I believe so. And are you guys still seeing the intro slide or are you seeing the, okay. I have the speaker intros up, but didn't want uh, those to be audience facing. Okay, and then the audience is coming in too. And I'm going to confirm that we are live on Facebook. Ah, here we are. Okay, yes. All right, so thank you everyone who's tuning in right now um, on Zoom or on Facebook. We're just going to take a moment as we're waiting for audience members to join and then we'll get started with tonight's presentation. Um, we really thank you for joining. We really thank the Science Bubble team for putting these together and we really thank tonight's speakers for being here. All right, so looks like we have our participants here and um, just as people um, start logging in, I'll introduce the program. Um, so welcome to Popping the Science Bubble, everyone. This is a monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and to create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they feel really passionate about. Um, the organizers are three graduate students at UC Berkeley, Jenna, Madison, and Oksana. Um, if you're interested in checking out the past seminars, um, Popping the Science Bubble has its own website along with a YouTube channel that has uh, presentations um, from the past year. And we plan to keep adding to um, our um, YouTube channel. Um, so do keep, do stay tuned. Um, once again, this is a monthly uh, seminar series and it happens every third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. Um, also, as a note, our monthly newsletter advertised different topics. Um, they it adver advertised the topics for June. Um, this month, we have different speakers. And so I will let um, uh, our Popping the Science Bubble team introduce this tonight's speakers. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, hi, yeah, as Kelsey said, um, I'm Madison, one of the graduate student organizers of Popping the Science Bubble. Uh, we're a group of uh, graduate student researchers who are bringing research from uh, UC Berkeley's campus to public facing through the Berkeley Public Library. So we're here every month, uh, excited to share a whole bunch of different topics. Our talks are interactive and we <laughs> encourage questions during, we'll be monitoring uh, the chat and the Q&A on Zoom. Um, so you can answer or ask questions as we go and um, we'll incorporate those into the talk that our uh, presenters will answer, but we will also have a small Q&A section after each talk. And I believe both of our presenters will be more than willing to answer questions in the chat uh, when they're not giving their talk as well. Um, so feel free to add uh, questions either, yes, in the Q&A chat or in the Facebook comment section. But otherwise, uh, we're very excited for uh, two researchers from UC Berkeley Physics Department today. Our first speaker is Chin Chin, who uh, grew up in Columbia, Missouri, but also lived uh, in China and is Denmark, or in Denmark growing up. Uh, she studied physics at MIT as an undergrad, uh, after which she did research in uh, various physics subfields, such as astrophysics and atomic physics, uh, and finally found uh, her interest in biophysics 
Um, and then before coming to Berkeley, Chin Chin spent a year uh, teaching hands-on physics and engineering to high school and college students uh, at an education nonprofit called Kepler in Rwanda. Uh, but now she's here at UC Berkeley getting her PhD in biophysics, uh, where she says one of her favorite parts of working at Berkeley uh, is the interactive and collaborative community. Um, and so outside of research, Chin Chin enjoys trying new foods, hiking, traveling, and playing chamber music. And we're excited to hear all about uh, her fields of science. So take it away. I will stop my share so you can share your screen. All right, um, can everybody hear me okay? We can oh, great. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Madison, for that really nice introduction. Um, and also, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about my research with you today. So microorganisms are single-celled microscopic organisms, and they include um, bacteria, archaea, um, fungi, such as yeast, and it also includes viruses, even though they are not cellular. In fact, defining a microorganism is challenging. And if you would like to read more, I found this article from the American Society of Microbiology to be very fascinating and informative. So I would uh, like to start off by asking all of you, where do we find microbes in our daily lives? And you can feel free to type your answer into the chat. Um, uh, and yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of read aloud what people put in. So where do you find microbes in your life? The kitchen, yeah, that is a great answer. There's so many microbes in um, the fridge, on surfaces, in our guts. Yep, the, there are definitely a lot of microbes in our guts. Soil, yeah, that's a great one. Um, lots of soil microbes. Cool, okay. Um, so I guess the examples that um, I thought of included fermented foods, such as cheese, bread, beer, pickles, as well as natural hot springs, such as the Grand Prismatic Spring and Yellowstone National Park, which contains microbial mats. Um, as well as human microbiomes, like our guts, as was mentioned, as well as um, the oral microbiome, which you can see here, where every color is tagging a different species of bacteria in the oral microbiome. Um, microorganisms are also human pathogens, such as Clostridium difficile, which is um, a fecal oral human bacterial pathogen, as well as um, what's been on all of our minds, SARS-CoV-2. So microbes evolve or change their genomic information to adapt to the environment extremely quickly. To illustrate this, here is an example of the bacteria E. coli that is initially sensitive to an antibiotic evolving to become resistant to the antibiotic in only 11 days. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, porous and thin agar, that bacteria can move around it. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic. It spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 
11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. On the outs. Okay. Um, yeah, so microbial evolution um, happens in our everyday lives as well. And one um, example that's on many of our minds is SARS-CoV-2 evolution. But microbial evolution doesn't always have to be bad. Um, in fact, one really exciting recent finding is that bacteria evolve within the healthy human gut. And by making better models of microbial evolution, we can better predict and control it. For instance, by creating vaccines that target new variants of pathogens, by making smarter antibiotic treatment strategies, or by designing better probiotic therapies. A scientist whose work I really admire in this field is that of um, Isabel Gordo. And I would just like to take a moment to highlight some of her work. Dr. Gordo is a professor of biology and the deputy director of science at the Goldbeckian Institute in Portugal. And she studied physics as an undergrad um, before studying evolutionary genetics in grad school. Her group studies microbial evolution in the mouse gut and was the first to show that multiple mutations can appear at the same time and compete with one another. Her group has also done seminal work on the effect of the interaction of multiple mutations on antibiotic resistance. And I find her work to be brilliant, inspirational, and creative. So um, let's take a deep dive into evolution. Uh, but before we do this, let's take a step back and talk about the central dogma, which is an explanation of the flow of genetic information in a biological system. Most microbes will express their DNA by first turning it into RNA and then turning it into proteins, which can have different biological functions. Some microbes, though, don't have DNA, but directly replicate their RNA. Um, but in general, evolution will act on the DNA or RNA, which downstream could affect biological function. So there are many different processes um, that occur for uh, evolution to happen. Uh, mutations are permanent alterations in the DNA or RNA and these occur due to mistakes in replication. Mutations will create variation between individuals that other evolutionary processes can use. Natural selection is the survival and reproductive success of individuals best adjusted to their environment. For example, a bacteria that has a muta mutation in activating a gene targeted by this antibiotic in that experiment can potentially grow better than the wild type in the presence of the antibiotic. Genetic drift is the process of uh, random changes in the number of individuals of each genotype in a population. And this maybe is not as evident as um, these other processes in that experiment that we looked at. So we'll return and talk more about this later. Migration is the movement of individuals to different locations. And in the case of this experiment, um, motile bacteria were inoculated on the plate um, at this location here, and they depleted their nutrients locally and then spread to other regions of the plate. And finally, recombination is the independent assortment of new combinations of genes in progeny that didn't occur in the parents. This occurs when two or more combinations of genes are present, and it's another way that organisms create variation for evolution to act on. So of all of these processes, the only one that is predictable, or in other words, given a set of initial conditions, we're able to predict what happens in the future, is natural selection. 
All of these other processes are unpredictable because they depend on chance or on probability. So let's talk about chance or probability. Um, it's chance and probability occurs when you repeat the same process and it leads to a different outcome. And I'd like to ask you guys to think about what are some examples of chance or probability in our everyday lives? And again, you can type your answer into the chat and um, I'll say out loud what, what you guys answer. So when do you see probability or chance in your life? All right, that's okay. Um, oh, here we go. Um, getting a red light or green light during your commute. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, the grocery store having my favorite ice cream when I go there. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah, those are really great examples. Um, so the ones that I thought of were playing the lottery, uh, drawing cards randomly from a shuffled deck, weather forecasting or election forecasting. And I would like to highlight that importantly, even though the precise outcome cannot be predicted, you can still learn about the system by measuring the probability distribution and give probabilistic predictions. And the probability distribution gives the probability of particular outcomes to occur. So let's talk about what's the role of chance in evolution. One way that chance manifests itself in evolution is through mutations. When mutations occur is random, as well as what observable trait the mutation changes, or in some case doesn't change. Another place where chance plays a role is with genetic drift. Um, and that's uh, which or when individuals give birth and die. And this occurs amongst even identical individuals. So it's different from natural selection. To think about what genetic drift means, here's a really simplified simulation. So here um, we start out with 10 individuals in the population. And in each generation, the parents can produce zero, one, two, or more offspring. But the population size always stays fixed. So we can simulate this by randomly drawing the progeny from um, in each generation from the parents in the previous generation. If we repeat this process many times, eventually one parent uh, takes over, or the progeny of one parent takes over, and in this case, it's the yellow parent. But if you repeated this, you would actually get different outcomes. So um, genetic drift is uh, interesting in that it depends on the population size. In a smaller population, uh, such as the one above, the strength of genetic drift is higher because there are fewer offspring to average over. So another way to think about this is the more times you flipped a coin, the closer you would get to observing 50% heads and 50% tails. One of the first experiments demonstrating genetic drift was by Peter Bury studying fly eye colors. He took a mixture of close to 50% flies of each eye color and mated them over time. And as time went on, the fraction of um, each eye color in the population will sometimes stray away from 50% due to chance. And when he repeated this many times, he could look at the probability distribution of the fraction of each color, color in the population and see that it flattened over time. Genetic drift is also important for influenza transmission between hosts. The number of virus particles from the donor host that colonizes the recipient host has been shown to be extremely small. In fact, it's only a handful of virions. And as a result, the diversity of influenza in the host will be lost upon transmission into the donor just due to chance. So what are the consequences of genetic drift for evolution? 
One consequence is that beneficial mutations could go extinct just due to chance. And conversely, harmful mutations can fix, um, or in other words, take over the population. The repeated fixation of harmful mutations in a population is referred to as Muller's ratchet. And um, how this works is a harmful mutation can fix in a population if genetic drift is strong enough. And in the absence of recombination, which if you'll remember is new combinations of genes that didn't occur in the parents, all the subsequent progeny will have that harmful mutation. This can continue many times and the organism eventually accumulates more and more harmful mutations. One of the early demonstrations of Muller's ratchet was in bacteriophage, which are the viruses that prey on bacteria. In this experiment, bacteriophage were streaked on a lawn of bacteria and each phage replicated to become more than 10 billion phage, forming a small circular empty space where they have consumed the bacteria. One of these so-called plaques is randomly chosen and streaked onto a new plate, where again, single phage replicates to almost a billion, 10 billion phage. And this process is repeated. Um, because randomly, it's more likely for harmful mutations than beneficial mutations to occur, over time, multiple harmful mutations accumulated. And it was observed that the fitness decreased on average by 22%. So through these two processes of beneficial mutations going extinct and harmful mutations fixing, genetic drift can affect the rate of adaptation or how fast the fitness increases or changes over time. So it's extremely important to understand the strength of genetic drift in a particular population so you can understand and predict how it will evolve over time. So now um, I would like to tell you a little bit about current research on genetic drift. So we know that genetic drift depends on the population size, but it's also affected by the variability in the number of offspring produced by each individual. But how do you actually infer genetic drift from data and what physiologically sets its value? Those are open questions um, that we are actively researching on. And we use microbes as a model system to investigate this question, not only because microbes are really important for life, but also because they replicate extremely quickly. They can replicate from a single cell to 10 billion cells in about 24 hours. So that allows us to visualize evolution in real time. So I want to share with you two vignettes of current research on these questions. The first is looking at evolution in microbial biofilms. Um, so uh, here we want to ask the question, how is genetic drift affected by mutations? So what are biofilms? Biofilms are slimy films of bacteria that adhere to a surface and can cause really bad infections, partly because they're hard to remove. In our experiments, we use a simplified model of biofilms by looking at colonies, which are bacteria that grow and push each other on a surface. First, we needed to develop a method to measure genetic drift. And the way that we did this was we looked at the movement of cells in a colony using beads. So you can see here the beads being pushed by cells as they're growing in the colony. And we can measure the displacement of the bead, which gives us a measure of the strength of um, noise or genetic drift in this system. Using this method, we measured about 200 genotypes of E. coli bacteria. And we found that the strength of genetic drift substantially differed between genotypes. And here are just two examples of genotypes where we found different strengths of drift. So why did this happen? We found that colony, col colony level properties were correlated with the strength of genetic drift. Um, and this included things like the roughness of the colony front and the area of the colony. 
So in sum, these results show that genetic drift can be modified by single mutations and that this occurs due to changes in colony morphology. Our results are exciting because they suggest that genetic drift can be an evolvable trait of a population. Or in other words, you can get mutations that change the strength of genetic drift. The second vignette that I wanted to tell you guys about is looking at epidemics. Um, so we would like to know what is the strength of genetic drift for the transmission of COVID-19? And in this project, we use publicly available data of genome sequences to look at how the number of each sequence varies over time. And by looking at the fluctuations in these sequences, we can extract out a measure of chance in the spread of COVID-19. Here are preliminary unpublished results of um, what's called the effective population size over time. And the effective population size is a measure of the strength of genetic drift in the system. And what we see is that um, the effective population size increased as the pandemic got worse. So these are, um, this is a really, uh, it's an ongoing project and we're still analyzing the data, but we hope that a measure of genetic drift for COVID-19 can help us to better understand the role of chance and transmission in different locations in the world. So in conclusion, um, we talked about how chance plays a role in evolution through mutations and genetic drift amongst other processes. Genetic drift in particular will affect which mutations establish in the population and that can affect the rate of adaptation. And current research is studying what physiologically affects genetic drift and trying to infer the strength of genetic drift from data. Our hope with this work is to make more accurate models of evolution that can be used for both prediction and control. And um, finally, I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Oscar Halicek, as well as my group members, particularly the ones who um, have worked with me on these projects. Uh, as well as um, uh, funding sources for our work. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this talk. Um, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak. And I'd be really happy to answer any more questions and continue the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Jushin. Um, we will have, yeah, uh, questions can come in through the chat or Q&A, uh, but maybe I'll start us off. So a uh, mutation for like, you know, antibiotic, which is basically a poison survivability would have to be like really specific, right? So it seems crazy that a whole bunch of different bacterial colonies can get to make that very specific mutation at what rate are mutations happening such that like more than one uh, bacterial colony can even escape that poison? Yeah, um, that's a, a really great question. And I actually don't have the mutation rate memorized off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right in that um, the, the rate of mutations isn't that high. Um, in fact, uh, E. coli and many other bacteria, they're really good at um, not making mistakes. <laughs> and if they make a mistake, they have repair machinery in, um, inside the cell to try to fix that. So it turns out that the mutation rate isn't actually that high, but the population size of bacteria um, is really, really high. So to give a sense of scale there, um, if you just took a milliliter of bacterial culture, it'll be about a billion cells. Um, and so even if you had a mutation rate as low as once every billion cells, if you grew up those cells, you, you would get a mutation. Um, I guess the other interesting point about mutations is that many mutations don't actually do anything to the cell. Um, and so uh, it's, it's very rare to get mutations that actually help you. Um, but I think it's the large population size in that experiment that allows multiple mutations to appear. 
cool. Thank you. If we have no other questions currently, you are free to add them in the chat uh, as we go along. And I think Chin Chin is more than happy to type back an answer. Um, and Oksana will introduce our second speaker. Great, so our second speaker today is Elizabeth who grew up near Boulder, Colorado and has always been fascinated with nature and mathematics. She received her bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Pennsylvania and is now working towards a PhD in physics at UC Berkeley. Elizabeth researches how different types of imperfections in materials can give rise to fascinating physical properties. Outside of physics, she enjoys hiking, swimming, and playing the violin. We are very excited for your talk. Take it away, Elizabeth. All right, hello everybody. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can hear and see. Excellent. So I wanted to echo what Chin Chin said and thank the organizers and the Berkeley Public Library for putting on this great event. And for everybody listening, I hope you learned something interesting and think about electrons a little bit differently today, after today. So I work on studying how electrons move. And I want to tell you today about a surprising discovery that spurred the field of research that I'm in today. And since this is a laid back talk and it's summer, I want you to think about this as going on a summer vacation to the, the quantum realm, as you've seen in superhero movies. And we're going to be guided by an electron and learn a lot about the electron's interesting characteristics. So I wanna start with the surprise. So in 1980, it was winter in the French Alps and Klaus von Klitzing was studying a very ordinary material. So I'll use my laser pointer throughout the talk. So he was studying a, silic a piece of silicon, which is a material that you find in everyday life, in your computer, in your smartphone and he wanted to ask a question about this everyday material, which was how do electrons flow through this material when you add a very, very strong magnetic field to it? And to study that, Klaus was measuring two different kinds of resistance that the electrons face as they move from side to side of the material. And from our understanding of physics, what Klaus expected to see was one kind of resistance would remain constant as he increased the strength of the magnetic field. And then the other kind of resistance would increase linearly. And this held true until Klaus managed to get his experiment up to about 30,000 times the strength of the magnetic field of the earth. And this is what he found. So we see that one of the resistances is a straight line. And then we start getting this very interesting staircase kind of structure. And then between the parts of the staircase, we have a leap up and the other kind of resistance. So to give you a bit of a handle on how bizarre this is, let's say that you and your friend are playing catch with a baseball and you throw the ball to your friend at like 38 miles an hour. And to catch it, your friend applies some force and the, and the baseball exerts some force on your friend. And you throw the ball again at like 39 miles an hour and your friend catches it and has the same amount of force. But then you throw the ball just a little bit higher, like 40 miles an hour. And then the ball exerts so much force on your friend that your friend completely falls down. That is a way of thinking about how something that looked linear or incremental becomes a tipping point like this. And from the flatness where nothing was happening and looking at this graph, Klaus von Klitzing was able to extract something called the resistance quantum. And this symbol here is called an ohm, it's a Greek letter. And this is a way of measuring how resistive 
how much resistance electrons face as they move through materials. And this single measurement on a everyday material had some really far reaching implications. And one I wanna share with you to start off is that it allowed us to rewrite the metric system. So we learn in school basic units that we have to measure the physical world. And some history behind how this started was that during the French Revolution, the leaders of the revolution, one of the major changes that they wanted to make was having a standard system of measurement because when they were ruled by the aristocracy before, they felt that not having this standard system was a way that they could be taken advantage of. So starting with the French Revolution, all sorts of metrology science bodies were developed. And one of the main quantities that they wanted to define was the kilogram to figure out how heavy things were. So the metrologists got together and they created eight, or seven identical objects that were the standard kilogram. And there was one gold standard kilogram that was kept in Paris, I think. And every 40 years or so, the metrologists would meet and they would measure each of the seven identical standard kilograms to see that they still agreed. Now, over about 200 years, the surface chemistry or something, it's actually still not completely known what happened to the, the kilograms, the seven kilogram standards, but they were no longer agreeing with each other. So in around 1970 or so, it was decided by the World Metrology Institute that the metric system had to be fixed and the kilogram had to be redefined in terms of something else. And it turns out that Klaus von Klitzing's measurement provided a key to being able to do this. So using a fundamental constant, Planck's constant H here, and measuring the resistance very, very precisely using the quantum Hall effect. In 2019, scientists were able to redefine the metric system such that they could reliably calculate precisely what a kilogram is. So beyond rewriting the metric system, this actually paved the way for the field that I study and a lot of other researchers that UC Berkeley study about a novel kind of electronics. But I'm gonna get back to that later. So we have a mystery here. We have this very important thing that rewrites how we measure things. And I wanna walk through following an electron, trying to figure out why it happens. So let's start with what an electron is. So you can see this is an atom, the building block of matter. And we have in the center of it, what we call the nucleus made of protons and neutrons. And then sort of orbiting are these electrons. You see these dots here. And the electron and the proton have opposite electronic charge. So they respond in an opposite way to electric fields. And it's interesting because while they have opposite charge, they have mass that varies by a factor of about a thousand. So the reason that matter is the way it is, is because of this fundamental imbalance, where because the electron is about a thousand times lighter than the proton, we can essentially treat the electron as an actor and the nucleus or the set of nuclei in a material as the stage. And when we look at this actor, and historically we thought the electron was a particle, like a ball that you throw. But what we've learned since and can actually measure is that the electron is also a wave. So just like a wave in water, like you go to the ocean and you see waves, electrons can be thought of in a similar way where the wave doesn't exist in a single place. It exists everywhere at once. And just like that, the electron, one electron at a given time is in multiple places at once. And this can be described by a single wave. So because electrons are waves, they could do something very interesting, which is that they can undergo interference. So I might need, here we go. I wanna show you a video about how this works. So in this video, you saw two point sources. 
And those two sources of waves came together to be one source of waves. So it looks like we have one wave now. And notice that there are regions where this one wave is really high, and there are regions where the wave seems to disappear altogether. So let me show this to you again, just to see how it happens. So we have the two sources, and then they come together to form something different. And electrons being waves can do exactly this. And I want you to especially realize the fact that they can basically cancel each other out sometimes in the right circumstances, just like a wave. So we have these electrons that can be described as waves and they can interfere with each other and do many things that waves can do. So how do they move? How do we study how things move? So I'll start by recalling a simpler question, which is if you kick a soccer ball, where does it go? Where will it be a certain time after I kick it? And questions like this, we know how to answer with the theory of classical mechanics. In this particular case, we can use Newton's second law and we can calculate the forces on the soccer ball to find the acceleration of the soccer ball. And then after a much later time, we can figure out where it is using the acceleration. Now the electron is not in a certain place because it's a wave. So the analogous question here is how likely is the electron to be at a certain place a certain time after it's kicked? It's not reliable, it's an erratic character. You can't always tell where it is. So in order to answer this question, scientists had to invent an entirely new field called quantum mechanics. And the analogous equation to Newton's second law is called the Schrodinger equation, which you may have heard of. So a simple example of how this works is you can think of replacing this element with hydrogen. So hydrogen, you just have a single proton. And we want to ask what happens to the electron when we take into account that it's a wave. And what we realized is that the electron basically lives on a given floor of a building. So the electron is allowed to live on this floor, the second floor, the third floor, and so on. And these floors are set by what the nucleus is. So the stage sets the building for the electrons. And we can make this arbitrarily complicated by changing from a proton to something else. So the next question, now that we've found the building where the electrons live is how do they fill up that building? So the simple answer is that electrons are lazy. You know, if you have a building and you can choose a place to live and you have to go up the stairs, you're gonna wanna live on the first floor. So if nothing else is going on, the electron will live on the first floor. But mathematics of quantum mechanics also tells us that the electron has to be very antisocial. So an electron and an identical electron to it are not allowed to live on the same floor. But if this electron were a different kind of electron, they could live on the same floor. So this has consequences for systems, especially how electrons move through systems, because we'll have many, many, many electrons to think about. So if I have three electrons and then two of them are blue, one of them is red, then this is the laziest way that they can under that they can fill up the building. So the blue one and the red one can be on the first floor, but the second blue one can't be on the same floor as the first blue one. So this is for something like a hydrogen atom, but if we wanna think about real materials, like the silicon that Klaus von Klitzing was measuring, we have to go to something a little bit more complicated. So instead of having a nucleus here and the electrons around a nucleus, let's think about many, many nuclei. So this is a salt crystal. So you have the green balls here are going to be sodium nuclei, and then the purple ones are chloride nuclei. And there are many, many electrons. And 
some of them will be waves that are shared throughout this whole this whole cube here. And I want to call attention to the fact that this is an ordered crystal. This is a perfect crystal on the right. So if I tell you the structure of this and I tell you where one of these dots is, then you'll actually be able to tell me where every single other dot in the system is. So it's a very predictable structure and perfect as we say. But if there's anything that we know about nature other than it's beautiful is that it's, it, it's not perfect. So solids often have something called disorder. So on the right, this is a picture of an aluminum oxide crystal. So you can see the aluminum are these blue dots and then the oxygen are white dots. And occasionally there's going to be a red dot in this structure, which is a chromium atom. And we call these replacements a form of disorder. So it's like having a slightly messy room. Not everything is quite in the place where it would be perfect, but this is quite common in nature. And disorder, despite being part of nature, has not always gotten the best reputation in physics. Um, a common word used to describe the chromium atoms that I just showed you is defects. And there are some unkind words about disorder that were part of the historical perspective. But today, physics has changed. And it's become recognized that disorder is part of materials. And to understand materials and appreciate materials, we have to take into effect that they're not perfect. And several Nobel Prizes have now been awarded to discoveries somewhat related to disorder. Philip Anderson was one of the pioneers in helping disorder be recognized as a valid and interesting branch of science. And also Klaus von Klitzing discovered Klaus von Klitzing's discovery is in the realm of disorder, as I'll show you later. And he also won a Nobel Prize. So disorder is so appreciated today that I am in a field that very much relies on disorder. And I like it so much that I wrote it a poem. So rubies are red, sapphires are blue, crystalline aluminum oxide, if not disordered, lets all the visible light through. So you see here a ruby and a sapphire. And the reason for these beautiful colors and gemstones is because about one or 2% of the oxygen nuclei are substituted by chromium in the case of ruby or other elements in the case of sapphire. So this small amount of imperfection causes a beautiful stone to appear that we would not have had if we didn't have the disorder. So beyond beauty, disorder is intimately related to what Klaus discovered. So if we think about our salt crystal, and I'll draw a little cartoon of what disorder is with these orange dots here. Imagine I have an electron wave. It doesn't even have to be an electron wave. You can also think of a water wave. But if I have a wave, going through something with irregularity, the wave is going to bounce off this dot and then it might bounce off this dot, this dot. And eventually what can happen is that the wave gets stuck in a tiny area of space. So if we didn't have these impurities, we would have a wave extending throughout the material, but because they exist, we get stuck in a tiny point. And this is what physicists call localization. And this phenomenon of localization is exactly what Klaus von Klitzing was seeing. So when Klaus was sending electrons from here to here, usually the electron waves got stuck. So you can think about when I through the baseball to my friend at 38 miles an hour, then 39 and there was no change. That's because there was a wave that got stuck. So these waves mostly get stuck, but every once in a while they don't get stuck. And 
when that wave extends all the way from here to here, like in this picture where it didn't get stuck, then we'll see a spike in the current that's allowed to flow from here to here. And then that will also lead to a change in the stair step about the other kind of resistance. So this is very precise and there's a whole field of physics and mathematics using that, this effect, which explains why this number is so precise derived from these stair steps and their placement. And just to give you an idea of how precise this is, it's one part in a billion taken in slightly different samples all over the world. So this beautifully precise number came out of materials that inevitably have imperfections. And if we go beyond just the fact of precision, this also opened the door to something called topological phases of electronics. So the system that I showed you can actually host electrons that live only on the edge and they run along the edge and they don't have any dissipation. They meet very, very, very little resistance. So these are called dissipationless edge states. And currently a lot of scientific research in Berkeley and all over the world is being dedicated to figuring out how we could bring these dissipationless edge states into technology to, for example, have a super duper efficient computer. And this is very important since computers and the internet consume so much of the world's energy that if we could use this technology, we could possibly cut the energy use in the future a lot. So this is a very exciting frontier and it was all discovered by surprise. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, you can uh, write your questions in the chat on Facebook or on Zoom or in the Q&A box. Uh, and until we get some questions from the audience, I can start with one. I was wondering if you could explain a bit, how do we measure where the electrons are between the different levels in practice? Like how do we, yeah, how do we measure that? That's an excellent question. So, let me go back to give a visual of what the levels are. So the way that we measure this, the way we learned about it is by interacting the electrons with light. So what can happen is that if you have a light beam, a beam of light, if it's one specific color, carries energy. And that beam of light can take one of these lazy electrons and it can take it to the next level. And eventually this electron will want to go downstairs again and this electron will re-emit that ray of light. So by studying which, which colors of light the atoms or the material interacts with, which ones it absorbs, which ones it emits back into the world, we can measure those and figure out what the structure was in the first place. Great, thank you. Thanks, Oksana. I'm happy to also answer questions offline later. I think uh, we ah. have a question in the chat now, yeah. So how does your research field interact with or overlap with particle physics? Ah, that is an excellent question. So typically when we think of particle physics from an experimental perspective, we're thinking about the nuclei. So the protons and the neutrons. So my research basically looks at an area where the electrons are the dynamic particles in our picture. And we kind of ignore the nuclei because they're so heavy and their movements are not as much. But what particle physicists do is they collide particles together and study what comes out 
of those collisions. So they work with much higher energy and they work in accelerators like CERN where you have to make the particles go really, 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 really fast to do anything when they collide with each other. And these experiments about the theory this, that I talked about today can actually be done in, an, in a tabletop experiment. So you don't need the same kind of international collaboration to build a very, very expensive fancy machine. Um, but I can also say something interesting, which is that a lot of the mathematical theories that describe quantum mechanics and the quantum Hall effect are the same mathematical theories that describe particle physics. So the fields have learned a lot from each other in terms of which math is best to describe very complicated things we're trying to understand. Uh, we also had a question. Uh, could you tell us more about your research? But I think this kind of covered it, but if there's anything else you'd like to add? Sure. So this is actually a discovery that created my field of research. What I study, which I won't go into any detail about, is I study what happens exactly between the two steps of the stairs. So I'm looking at what value does this spike have? And I'm also modeling how disorder plays into that. When did you get interested in this topic? So I'm really interested in electrons in general. And I also, as I hope, my poem demonstrated have always had an affinity for disorder. I always appreciated having a slightly messy room when I was a kid. I think my, my parents appreciated that less, but I've always been fascinated by the idea that by changing something from being perfect just a little bit, we can have vastly different physics. Yeah, thanks for the question. Well, if there are no more questions right now, you can also email us later on. Uh, also, if you're rewatching the recording and we can uh, send your questions to our speakers. And thank you both again for volunteering to speak with us today. Yes, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us. Um, these are two great presentations. Thank you so much. Um, and I encourage user, viewers to um, go to Popping the Science Bubbles YouTube account if they want to um, reference these talks again. Thank you so much, Chin Chin and Elizabeth and Oksana. Thank you.